Good evening, everyone. This is County Councilwoman Monique Anderson Walker. And welcome to the Henson Creek Village Area Study Charette. We're very excited about the opportunities for developing a downtown Fort Washington or a town center Fort Washington. And this charrette is for you, the public, to comment on what you'd like to see. It's also an information session so that you will learn uh, what some of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are within this area study. As we move forward, we want to keep in mind that um, development is something that is based on many factors. Uh, one of those factors is the feasibility of building what one desires. And much of that is based on environmental factors. We will focus on some of those environmental factors today in addition uh, to design ideas. We have with us today HRNA. We'll talk about concepts and K KCI Technologies who will educate us on some of the environmental um, nuances in this area, characteristics in this area. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before I toss it to our uh, community uh, consultant, outreach consultant, Steve Bingham, I want to say remember to fill out your census. You have until September 30th. Uh, this will be recorded and will be replayed so that you can have access to it should you need access. Keep in mind you can always ask questions within the chat and uh, at this time I just want you to remember we're all in this together. Let's work together to make our community what we want it to be. At this time, I'm gonna to toss it to Steve. Thank you, Councilwoman, uh, and good evening, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Um, can, we, can, can we please have the Councilwoman put her camera back on for a moment and speak to the audience, Steve? Thank you. So uh, she's gonna to have to turn her camera back on because I can't, yes. I can't turn okay. it on. Thank you. Councilwoman, can you quickly turn your camera on? Because I got it. You, you were in the dark during that period of time. <laughs> My apologies. Why don't you just say a quick hello, even though you just went through your uh Yes, well, you know, we can, we can get started. And uh, if you'd like, we can keep the camera on. If it's going to be distracting, we can, we can turn it off. But please move forward, Steve. Thanks. All right, great. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. Uh, really delighted to be here. Steve Brigham from Public Engagement Associates, part of the consulting team working with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And as the councilwoman said, this is... Uh, our second meeting for uh, looking at uh, the Henson Creek Village area study. Uh, probably at least some, if not many of you, were with us in our very first meeting back in late March. Uh, and so uh, just, just to give you, get you all grounded in why we're here tonight, what are we going to focus on? So we hope over the course of the evening that we will orient you or reorient you to what is the focus of this study? Uh, we also will share community survey results uh, that many of you may have participated in. We're going to share some of the initial findings from the economic and market analysis that ha has been done. We're going to orient you to uh, the focus of the environmental study that has gotten uh, just started in recent weeks. Um, and so the agenda, uh, so first you will hear that overview. Uh, and then I will review at a very high level uh, the results from the community survey. Uh, uh, you have the opportunity to chat uh, tonight so that you can put your comments in chat. And there'll be a few times in which we are actually asking specific questions for you to answer in the chat. Uh, and then um, the, the heart of the meeting really is built around two core presentations. So HRNA, uh, one of our consultant teams, has been doing an economic and market analysis and they want to share their initial findings. After that, we'll actually ask a survey question or a polling question. Mm -hmm. We'll get a chance to do some Q&A and we'll ask you to type your response to a, a question about the presentation in the chat. Then we will move to our last presentation of the evening, which is the scope of the environmental analysis that is just getting underway and that will be conducted over the next couple of months by KCI. Mm -hmm. we'll, um, we'll do the same thing then. We will uh, then open it up to Q&A. So there's a Q&A box that you can click on and ask questions for our panel over the course of the evening. 
and our team will be taking a look at those. The chat box, which also is at the bottom of your screen, you click on that uh, and you can chat now or you can wait until we have specific questions that we're gonna ask in chat and we'll share some of the things that you put in there. And then we'll close the evening probably around 8.30 with just sharing next steps, what you can expect to happen in the weeks to come and when we will reconvene. Um, and so uh, to get us started, we actually want to uh, ask a few polling questions. So I'm going to uh, ask you to all uh, answer our first question. And let me bring it up here. So the first question is around where you live. And uh, we've got eight options here. Uh, what I would say is if you don't live exactly in one of these eight places that you uh, actually uh, do uh, click on something that's close to you. Uh, and there also is an option at the very bottom. If you scroll down, it may not show up on your immediate screen for elsewhere in district eight. So I know we've got approximately 86 participants. Uh, and so I'm gonna leave this open for a little while. It looks like we've had close to half of you actually answer. So again, I ask you to, if you're, if you're here and wanna share where you're uh, zooming in from to, to let us know uh, what geography best uh, uh, fits where you're zooming in from. So I'll leave it open for another five, six seconds, and then I'll close it so we can move to a second question. <clears throat> All right, so what I'm seeing here is the vast majority of folks live in the Fort Washington area, which makes a lot of sense because that is where our study area is. But we have some folks from Camp Springs, we have some folks from Temple Hills, we have some folks from Clinton, and we have some folks from elsewhere in District 8. Uh, and you should be able to see the results. So again, uh, a good portion of you from the Fort Washington area. So now I'm gonna ask you to answer our, our second question. What is your age? We wanna get a sense of the range of uh, folks who are uh, participating tonight. That's great. And so I, you know, you, there's um, seven different options here and uh, looks like I'm just, I'm, I'm getting to see the answers as they come in. We have a lot of betters in the room, 65 or better, which I, I love characterizing it that way. I'm gonna give you about five more seconds to answer. We've had about 50 or so of you answering the question. And then I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So about a third of you are 65 or better. That's great to, to see. Uh, and we have a similar uh, amount of uh, both in the 45 to 54 and the 55 to 64 range. Smaller amounts in kind of the Gen Y and Gen Z, 11% uh, and 9%, but a, a nice mix of ages in the room. Yes. Uh, Councilman, feel free to weigh in if you wanna say anything, I've got a couple more questions here. Well, I'm just really excited to see that there's a nice demographic represented. Yeah, for and sure. And that's important, yeah. All right, now we get to see, so we've all been doing, potentially been doing a lot of virtual meetings, but in, in particular wanting to know whether you have actually participated in a virtual community meeting, like the one we're doing tonight over the course of the last six, seven months. Uh, and feel free, you know, if you haven't, feel free to let us know that. Just click on none. And I'm, I'm going to give you about five, six more seconds, but I, I know we have close to 90 folks. I'm seeing right now I've got about 55 people who've answered. So I want to encourage people who have not answered the poll yet to answer that. All right, I'm going to close it and share the results. Uh, and so uh, the highest amount has done more than five community meetings. So you guys are the diehard uh, community representatives. 
Uh, that's great to know. Uh, a number of people, uh, 27%, two to four, Fifteen uh, percent have done one, so this is your second one. And for for twenty eight percent, this is your very first one. So we're glad to welcome you. We hope you have a great experience tonight. Uh, thanks for for joining us tonight. And then I have one more question, uh, and that has to do. We're going to share in a few moments the results of the community survey that we did. But just curious whether you were able to participate in the survey. So again, I'm going to encourage people uh, to, to, to let us know. Uh, don't be bashful. Uh, polling is really easy. Just click on one of the three options here. Right now, I've got about 50 of you who have cast votes, but I'd love to get more in the last six, seven seconds here. And let me end the polling and share the results. So a little less than half, about 39%, uh, did complete the survey. So thank you for doing that. 54% um, no, and there's a few of you, and I appreciate you being honest, can't remember or you're not sure. I know how that goes, you know, the pandemic can do that to your minds, right? Uh, and to your memories. Uh, so, so thank you very much for, uh, for doing that. We'll have uh, polling questions throughout. Uh, but I'm going to end that here. And uh, let me introduce, um, we're going to move to our first presentation. Uh, and this is Chidi Umeo Zulu from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, also the project lead from MNCPPC. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chidi, and I'll also bring up your slides. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chidi Umiozulu from the Prince George's County Planning Department. I'm the project leader for the Hansing Creek Village Area Study. This project was introduced at the March 24, 2020 Community Virtual Meeting, which I think was the first virtual meeting that you all have attended uh, because of the COVID. I want to take a few minutes to recap the goals of the study for the interest of those who did not attend the meeting and to refresh the memories of those who attended. The slide shows a map of the study area looking from above and is identified in yellow. It contains one of the two proposed transit villages along Indian Head Highway by the approved Hansen Creek South Potomac Master Plan. The transit village is identified in pink to the east of the study area is Indian Head Highway. To the west is Tall Bryant Estate and Broad Creek Historic Village is in the south. The predominant uses are auto automobile-related commercial and industrial uses. And this, this area is anchored by the Livingston Square Shopping Center. Hensing Creek Valley occupies approximately one third of the study area and contains the Hansing Creek Trail. Next slide. One of the goals of the study is to seek ways to implement the master plan recommendation for mix of uses and create a pedestrian oriented village center. After the master plan was approved in 2006, little investment has occurred within the study area. The second goal is to evaluate the opportunities for redevelopment by understanding the economics and real estate market and identify the niche market for the area. The third goal is to understand the environmental conditions and to evaluate the opportunities the stream valley may offer and address flooding issues in the general area. Um, the fourth goal is to capitalize on the flexibility of the proposed zoning ordinance, which will be under review and consideration for adoption to be placed on the ground. Well, since the last March meeting, the planning department has been doing a lot of work. First, 
we sought and retained the services of uh, two nationally known firms specializing in two key areas that are needed to move the vision for the area forward. They will be presenting to you their initial findings and uh, recommendations shortly. HR and A advisors have been collecting and analyzing data that informs realistic economic and market strategies and recommendations, identifies niche market, provides development scenarios based on realistic assumptions, implementation strategies, and action plans. Um, KCI Technologies Incorporated has been performing environmental assessment of the larger area to understand causes of flooding in the area and provide sound environmental protection and preservation and environmental sensitive development strategies. We did an online community survey that was designed and just completed. It was a way to gauge what you think and how you feel about the study area. With the help of your councilwoman, Anderson Walker, participation was great. And we thank you for that. With that, I conclude my presentation and would like to turn to Steve to share the survey findings. Thank you. As Chidi said, uh, we were really pleased with the, the, how the community turned out for taking the survey. And so I'm gonna do a very high level review. Obviously, uh, we, we had many, many people filling out the survey, lots of really great data, but, but here are the high level results. So we had almost 300 people participate uh, the vast majority lived pretty close to Henson Creek Village itself, whether that was by walking distance, which was 16% of the, the uh, participants, or another 54% uh, that lived within seven minutes of driving distance. So 70% lived pretty close to the, the study area. And uh, nearly two thirds of uh, the respondents also visit the businesses in the study area. So this is clearly an area that people know well and uh, uh, frequent uh, quite a bit. Uh, and then there was a question asked about uh, what did people believe or, or who did people believe that the, the businesses in this study area actually serve? And more than half of you or half of the survey respondents said uh, they believe that it's both uh, the nearby residents uh, as well as residents from outside that seven minute driving distance, as well as commuters that are coming through the area, uh, predominantly on Indian Head Highway, but either in the morning or the evening or during the day. Um, and then uh, we asked folks uh, to uh, uh, a series of questions about um, kind of how they would describe the place. And so people, 85%, said they want a new sense of identity to be created in this study area. Similar amount, 83% said they'd love to see a neighborhood quote unquote main street that is quite walkable, bikeable, and it's a re relaxing place to hang out in. 81% uh, really appreciated the wooded part, the, the kind of the natural part of this site, the stream valley, the wetlands, uh, and saw it as a place to learn about nature and as well as just to appreciate it. Uh, three quarters of the survey respondents were concerned about the flooding and how it affects both the study area and the residential areas around uh, this study area and the quality of life of those residents. Um, almost two thirds think highly of the study area. And then we did ask a question about uh, it, like if there was to be residential uh, options in the study area, what, how, how would you evaluate low rise apartments or condos and a little less than 50% of you would support those kinds of housing options in the study area. We asked what kind of businesses would cause you to spend more time in the study area. And if you look at the top two bullets, this is what we heard by far most frequently. Um, better grocery stores, 
with healthier options. So healthy grocery stores was the, the top option followed closely by more dining options, but not just any old dining options, upscale dining options and fast casual dining options, but no longer looking for fast food options in the study area. And then there were about a half dozen other things that were repeated frequently, but didn't rise as high as the first two bullets that you see here. So clothing stores, places for recreational activities or kind of expanding beyond, beyond what's already there, coffee shops, places to buy household goods, hardware stores, uh, and a fuller range of retail options. And then a number of folks said auto repair. Um, and then we asked the question, so what would you suggest that would give Livingston Road area a more appealing character? And so folks were really thinking about improvements and upgrading. So improvements in the roads and in the sidewalks, kind of the, that kind of infrastructure, upgrading the existing businesses along the lines of what we saw on the last slide along with new upscale ones, landscaping upgrades, so not just roads and sidewalks, but landscaping, more green space, wanting to appeal to the Gen Y, Gen uh, Z uh, generations in the area, giving the area a more natural look, so really taking advantage of what's already there, revitalizing Livingston Square, updating it, and making sure that the site really kind of hangs together with a connected theme, feel, and look. Um, and then we asked folks to describe the study area in a few words. And this is just a sampling of what we heard because we got literally hundreds of responses. Um, but uh, we heard kind of a range from it really, the area needs a lot of work uh, to make it more appealing, both aesthetically and environmentally. It's great, but it needs to be updated. It's unkept, unloved, tacky, and mostly inviting. Uh, but then people really kind of thought about this aspirationally. So could we revitalize, revitalize this so it becomes our town center? That they see it as neglected, but has a real possibility of opportunity, both residentially, you know, for residents and for businesses. Um, it's an interesting area with great potential if the right amenities are there. Uh, and then uh, folks also, again, kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, a, a little outdated industrial and 70s themed. So what we want you to do briefly is if you don't mind, just answer this question in the chat box. So just click on the, click on the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen and answer this question real briefly. What stands out for you as very important from what you just heard from the survey results? What, what stands out for you? What, what seems really important to emphasize in terms of what we heard from the 295 people that took the survey. What stands out for you as very important from those results? So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so I'm able to actually uh, look at the chat here. And let's see, so uh, we're getting some responses in here. So someone said healthy grocery and fast casual dining, the need for better food options. Uh, Let's see, upscale dining, not fast food. So that you're, you're saying some of the same things that we saw uh, during the survey uh, and kind of lifting that up. Healthy food choices need to be uh, rescued from uh, the area being a food desert. Uh, updating, it, it looks outdated. Uh, connecting people to nature. Again, we're seeing several healthy grocery store options, healthy food options. Uh, revitalizing Livingston Square. Someone suggested the bank. Uh, someone just said clean. Uh, the cohesive, cohesiveness of the area. So making sure things are more connected. Uh, revitalizing town center. Someone really liked the idea of a town center. So uh, it's great to see you echoing a lot of the same things that we saw in the survey. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read through all these, but feel free to keep on putting this in because we're going to be saving the chat and, and taking a closer look at it uh, after tonight. Uh, and so with that, um, I am going to turn us over to the HRNA team that Chidi referenced before. Stan Wall is the head of that team and he'll introduce the folks that will be uh, uh, with him in this presentation and uh, you guys can take it away and share your screen and we're, we're good to go. Thanks and welcome Stan.
thank you so much, uh, Steve, and thanks you, Councilwoman Anderson. Uh, it, it's great to be here this evening with our team uh, to talk about how we will evaluate the economic and market analysis conditions in the Hens Creek Village with the goal of understanding what is the path toward revitalization. Uh, I am Stan Wall, I'm with HRNA Advisors. We're a real estate development, economic development advisory firm uh, that works on the intersection of public and private sectors. So understanding how to bring together those two entities to transform communities, revitalize urban environments. And our work is, you know, locally, we're very active in Prince George's County, but we also do work across the country. Uh, I'm joined by my colleagues, Alex Stokes, Jake Levitis, and Solomon Abrams. And we're also supported Hello. by Tool Design, an engineering firm uh, that specializes in helping communities plan, build, and improve their transportation systems. And Dan Reed from Tool Design will be talking to you later in this presentation. So it was great to hear the results uh, of the survey, as well as hearing in the chat those areas that you all find important for this area, uh, because we're, we're already going down that path. And the goals that we have for the economic and market analysis within the study area include first and foremost, creating a visionary and feasible plan for downtown Fort Washington that has a vibrant, walkable mix of retail housing community space. Uh, we want to utilize Henson Creek as a recreational and environmental amenity, integrating recreation into floodplain management. Uh, and I, I know that we heard earlier about the concerns around flooding uh, and looking at ways to turn that into an amenity and preserving natural spaces near the creek. Uh, we want to make sure that, again, in response to the community's goals, that we attract a diverse set of local retailers that bring a variety of high quality, appealing dining and shopping options to area residents. We also wanna focus on supporting new, as well as the established small businesses uh, that are in the area through markets, pop-up spaces and more. And finally, we wanna support community health and wellness with walkability as well as healthy retail and food options. And again, you all have just communicated these exact same goals you know, coming out of the survey process. So it's great to know that we're already in alignment with what you all are, are looking for. Uh, looking at precedent projects, we want to kind of think about where we see the village going in the future and what examples we might hope to emulate. Uh, the challenges and successes across the region, you know, have a lot of lessons learned that we can draw from to help integrate balance its aspirations uh, with market realities as well as consumer preferences. You know, some of the areas that we're looking at for inspiration and ideas include Bladensburg, Maryland, uh, where the Anacostia River forms a great amenity for that community with waterfront parks integrated into the Anacostia Trail. Oxen Hill, Maryland, right around the corner, and the high quality townhomes next to National Harbor that leverage you know, their elevation and proximity to the waterfront to create a great experience for your residents there. Um, Arlington, Virginia, uh, where that community is going through the transformation of Columbia Pike from a strip center oriented suburban highway to a much more mixed use walkable corridor. Uh, Columbia, Maryland, which is in the midst of its own 20 year downtown revitalization to convert its older suburban village into a mixed use downtown and also taking advantage of its natural amenities and, and lakefront setting there. Uh, as we look at the, the floodplain issue and the, and the flooding issue, one thing that we're very much focused on and working with KCI, and you'll hear much more about this later on, is how do we convert flooding and the floodplain into something that can be amenity. So we don't want to just put a concrete stormwater pond in or put up you know large levees that you know do take care of the water but just create a further disconnect between residents and the creek. We want to look at creative ways so we can turn flood mitigation into a more of an amenity for the Hens Creek Village and more of an amenity for the surrounding uh, residents that live around the area. Looking at uh, what we're dealing with in terms of market drivers and constraints. So as we start on our market analysis and economic study, uh, there are four key areas that will you know, need to be examined in order to understand what's possible in this area. First, looking at zoning, understanding density, height, and use restriction, and how they support or limit the extent of redevelopment on any particular site in this area. But environmental issues, uh, we must, con you know, we must con conform with strict regulation uh, with development in the floodplain along stream. Uh, to make sure that you know, we don't impact those areas in a negative way. And doing so also will impact the feasibility of large development projects. Um, looking at development feasibility more directly, understanding how to maximize the benefits while balancing costs uh, is a priority for developers as well as a priority uh, for Prince George's planning. Uh, in low density areas where there's no public transit, 
It may be difficult to build the higher density projects with the amenities that we're seeking, but we want to explore how we might make that possible. Uh, and finally, very critically, is supply and demand. Uh, new uses, in terms of retail uses in particular, can only be built if there's a sufficient unmet demand to justify their construction. And again, in this presentation, you'll hear more about kind of our early findings as it relates to retail demand. Collectively, these factors will determine what kind of uh, the potential of this area and how we can attract new development and new types of retail to the area. Uh, I'll wrap up uh, my component so it's just a kind of a look at the current uses. And you all are very familiar with this area and understand kind of what exists today in terms of you know, older office building uses, narrow sidewalk, overgrown sidewalks, you know, the Livingston Square Mall that's you know, missing stores and, and needs reinvestment. You know, that kind of forms our current fabric today. Uh, what is also very notable is that there are no people living within Henson Green Village. And what you will often see in the most vital, vibrant areas around the region is a mix of both residents as well as retail to create that vibrant, walkable uh, environment that people really want to enjoy. Um, so again, as we move forward, we'll be looking at, you know, how do we change that environment to actually foster moment that we want to see happen in Hens Creek Village. I'll now turn it over to Dan Reed from Tool Design to talk about some of the existing can conditions around transportation. Thank you. And Stan and Dan, let me just interrupt. So I'm going to ask folks, um, as you're listening to this presentation, thank you, Stan, um, if you have questions, to put them in the Q&A box, because after this presentation is over, we're going to ask a question to have uh, you chat on, we're going to ask a poll, and then we're going to open it up for eight or ten minutes uh, to have them answer your questions. So if you have specific questions, please type them into the Q&A and uh, our panel will take a look at them and answer as many as we can. Sorry about that, Dan, go ahead. Dan, you're on mute. There we go. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Dan Reed. I'm a planner with Tool Design Group in Silver Spring. We are part of the team helping to develop uh, the transportation side of the vision for Henson Creek Village. And one of the common themes I've noticed in the comments here is that people are really interested in having a higher quality of retail and a, and a more of a mix of uses in this community. And one of the, the ways to help create that environment is to improve the walking and biking environment because it creates, the, it'll help create the kind of place that people both uh, feel comfortable strolling and enjoying street level retail, but also can leverage one of the community's biggest assets, which is the Henson Creek Trail itself. Uh, and right now the sidewalk and trail network in Henson Creek Village is largely disconnected from the trail, which is a large regional connection throughout Southern Prince George's County, but also connections to the surrounding neighborhoods. So if you wanted to walk to the community that people envision here, you can't right now. Uh, one of the opportunities to improve that network, however, is by looking at the, the current street itself on Livingston Road and how the space is allocated. Um, even though Livingston Road is a big four lane road, the traffic volumes are actually really low uh, for a road of that size, which creates an opportunity to repurpose some of the existing public right of way for better sidewalks, landscaping, even bike facilities that can improve connections to the trail while also being able to have enough space to accommodate the traffic that currently uses that road today and may use it in the future. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, one thing that we're gonna hear come up throughout uh, this process is the existence of the floodplain. Uh, around Henson Creek and its ability to potentially constrain development uh, along the Livingston Road corridor. Uh, but one of the ways that we can leverage that is by improving the Henson Creek Trail itself and doing stormwater improvements that can collect stormwater and prevent it from overflowing into homes or businesses, but also double as park space. Uh, you know, while a lot of our ideas for this area are very preliminary, one of the common themes that has come up is using the creek as an opportunity to create a destination, particularly as perhaps like part of a park and a, a more connected pedestrian and bike network that in turn can be leveraged to attract more development to this area. So, all right, I believe I'm handing it back over to HRNA. Yes, thanks, Dan. Um, so, yes, um, lots of uh, opportunities on the transportation side. 
Um, in addition, we did a, uh, a review of some of the assets that exist within Fort Washington, relatively close to Henson Creek Village. Uh, you can see on the map and also in the photos, we have a number of retail amenities that are fairly walkable, although in the case of Tanger Outlets, um, suburban in nature, uh, more urban typology at National Harbor. We also have a number of historic sites, both open space and structures um, that could provide inspiration in terms of the design, the look and feel of really that, as the uh, councilwoman was saying, that sort of main street for um, Fort Washington for this part of Prince George's County, including St. John's Episcopal Church and Harmony Hall. For the open space side, we have Fort Washington nearby and Fort Foot. We also have a number of recreational and wellness uh, amenities in the area, including the marina at Tantalon, um, the, the National Golf Club, and in addition, the golf driving range within uh, Hanson Creek Village, as well as, of course, the hospital within a mile or two of our study area, which, of course, can give us some themes for the kinds of uh, wellness uses and walkability we want to see in our study area itself. Um, and then just a little bit to, to start things off on the market analysis side with demographics. Um, so within Fort Washington and also within the county, you can see some key metrics relating to population, median household income, and median age. Uh, what we, I think, are seeing here is the result of a community that has grown in place um, where maybe certain uh, you know, kids within households have gone off to school or gone off to work. And so the population itself over the last 10 years or so has fallen just a little bit, even as the county's population has grown. Um, and you can also see that in the median age, which is 10 years older than the county median, um, we also are able to, oh, I see, Tantala. <laughs> um, yes, that's what I meant. Um, and um, the median household income is substantially higher than in the county average. What we will see in a minute in the retail section is that there is certainly retail within Henson Creek Village and in some surrounding shopping centers, but given the amount of spending capacity there is, in Fort Washington and near Henson Creek Village, a lot of people are not actually having their needs met within an easy driving distance and having to drive further away to meet their needs, which in fact represents a real opportunity uh, for this district in terms of bringing in more retailers, bringing in more uses, finding some of those things that Steve was flagging from the survey as being appealing additional retailers and restaurants we might want to see within the corridor. And with that, I'll turn it over to Solomon to talk a little bit more about retail. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so generally, retail in Henson Creek Village is older, it's auto-oriented, strip mall product. Uh, Livingston Square Shopping Center, anchored by Giant Food, accounts for 40% of the 220,000 square feet of retail in the village. Uh, it's been vacant for several years pending redevelopment. So while overall retail vacancy is below the county average of 4%, when the empty shopping center is factored in, vacancy increases to 45%. Um, taking a look at the map on the right, a new retail development in the area is concentrated north in National Harbor area. It's represented by two types of development, uh, mixed use walkable at the waterfront and traditional auto oriented suburban at Tanger Outlet. Excellent. Uh, but despite this new development at National Harbor and existing shopping centers to the south and the west, residents within a 10 minute drive of the village are still underserved by current retail in the area. Uh, the top three categories that, that residents are traveling out for are general merchandise, restaurants, uh, and building and garden. And what this suggests is that residents in the area could support uh, additional retail that's developed. Um, in considering the types of retail that can be supported, we also need to evaluate where current retail is located. Uh, for example, we've mapped several building and garden stores within seven miles of the drive shed. Uh, and it may be that these meet the demand of residents in the area which is to say that as the area is framed for development, uh, community needs will have to balance with retail decisions to locate in the village. Excellent. And as far as uh, structures to accommodate retail, there's a wide variety of building types that could work in the area uh, and conform with zoning, floodplain, and parcel size constraints. Uh, the first is shopping center redevelopment which involves repositioning existing shopping plazas through redesign and renovation with a focus on pedestrian accessibility and appeal. Uh, the second is freestanding retail, similarly walkable and street facing uh, with retail as its sole use. And the third is ground floor retail as part of a larger mixed use high density development uh, with housing or another use above. 
Excellent. And for takeaways, the Henson Creek Village is a corridor in flux. The retail stock is notably older, but it's prime for new development. Uh, there are unmet retail needs. Uh, for example, our analysis and community surveys have made it clear that the area could use more restaurants and other neighborhood serving retail. Um, third, there's a growing market for pedestrian oriented retail. So as housing development increases population density, demand for walkable retail options to serve the community needs will also increase. Uh, and fourth, uh, continued emphasis on the placemaking process. And that includes supporting retail development uh, in the area that reflects the identity of the, of the uh, residents in the area with a focus on quality, health, and the existing strengths. Uh, and last, shopper experience. So supporting walkable access to Henson Creek and improving the pedestrian experience uh, will help transition the village into a retail destination. Um, so I'll now hand it off to Jake to discuss housing. Thanks, Solomon. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a moment and remind everyone that you can continue submitting uh, questions in the Q&A box. We've got over a dozen so far, which is fantastic. So we'll answer those um, at the end and, and we are getting them. So thank you. Um, for the residential side, we, we first wanted to look at where and what types of multifamily, so apartments and, and condo projects are taking place in the area relatively close to the site in this part of the county. And what we saw is that since 2000, in the last 20 years, new market rate development has really been focused around the Branch Avenue Metro Station, as well as at National Arbor and Oxon Hill. Um, and new affordable projects have been uh, scattered you know, somewhat close to existing multifamily developments along that east-west highway corridor, um, including as well a couple of projects, uh, affordable projects close to Henson Creek Village to the south. One of the interesting things that we discover that I'm sure many of you uh, have experienced as well is that you know a lot of the areas in the counties multifamily housing is coming up on 50 and 60 years old. Uh, and a lot of these buildings, a lot of these multifamily apartment buildings have not been renovated um, in the last 20 years. And um, that means that, you know, potentially there's an opportunity uh, to meet the demand of everyone who would like to live in this part of the county, but it's looking for a little bit of a newer um, housing product. So, uh, you know, the, the aging uh, of these buildings may be an opportunity to, to meet some of that demand within Henson Creek Village. As far as what that housing might look like, we looked within the region as well as um, through uh, our experience in development throughout the country for a few typologies that we thought might make sense here as part of this vision um, that we outlined at the beginning uh, that was, was driven by the community for this you know, mixed use, um, vibrant uh, sort of downtown Fort Washington area. And um, again, with no one living in the area now that we realize this represents uh, a change um, in, in, the, in this type of development, uh, but think that uh, with, with the combination with the rest of the vision, um, as we've outlined, and, and that we'll progress with, with uh, community input over the next several months, that uh, these types of housing could potentially work uh, really well in, in Henson Creek Village. So the first of those is uh, townhomes, and these are this example is taken from uh, Suitland nearby, uh, that we've seen th this type of product be really successful with lots of demand um, and just uh, you know, really uh, well received by the community there. Um, the second one is garden apartments and the, the, the photo here is really of a, a newer version of the types that we've seen, um, uh, you know, existing in this part of the county for a long time. A lot of those, uh, you know, 60s and 70s buildings that uh, we just looked at are this type of apartment. So a little bit larger, a little bit, um, you know, more density, but um, lower density than something like you might see in National Harbor or other parts of the county or the region. Um, uh, the last category is multifamily, and um, you know, wh while this type of project is more common around transit nodes like Branch Avenue, um, you know, this type of mixed-use development gets you the opportunity to include retail and residential within the same building, which means um, you can have you know, more density, more people, and more local businesses within um, a smaller building footprint, which also uh, ends up reducing uh, flooding and, and stormwater runoff as well. So uh, to wrap up, um, 
Henson Creek Village today is a relatively low density community um, surrounded by uh, uh, you know, mostly older single family and, and older multifamily residences. Um, in recent years, neighborhoods to the north have seen a lot of healthy market rate development, um, as well as a few new affordable projects uh, built around the area. The most uh, rapidly growing neighborhoods are those that benefit from either some type of amenity like a waterfront or, uh, or shopping or a convenience to transit. And while these aren't currently present at, at Henson Creek Village, this is something that, that we think could work really well in the area in the future. And then finally, um, we'd like to improve uh, Henson Creek Village or see an opportunity to improve the image of the area with open space and streetscaping improvements that could uh, help support increased residential demand in this area. And to talk a little bit about uh, potential improvements that uh, might work here in the short term, I'll turn it over to Dan from Tool again. And Dan, I think you're on mute again, sorry. <laughs> One of the recurring themes that we've heard, at least in the question and answers here in the chat, is a desire for more retail, more opportunities for entertainment, more things for, just for, for people to do um, in the area. And the development timeline can be very long. It can take several years uh, from start to finish for anything to get built. So, you know, we've been thinking about things that can happen in Henson Creek Village in the near term uh, to improve the quality of life for this community. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is doing uh, sort of programming some of the spaces that might exist there. You know, many of them are empty parking lots or underused parking lots, uh, hosting things like farmers markets, community festivals, music events, uh, provided uh, given the current circumstances with social distancing if necessary um, to hold those events, but things to give people a reason to come and spend time in this place now and to help build the, the foundation for attracting retail and other amenities in the future. Um, streetscaping improvements can happen in the near term to improve the aesthetics of Livingston Road, landscaping, uh, street trees, lighting, banners, uh, making it a nicer place to walk or bike or drive through, uh, as well as creating a trailhead today on Livingston Road to access the Henson Creek Trail, which currently is both uh, away from the road, but also on the other side of the creek. Uh, so improving that connection today will help create uh, a destination within the village itself to draw people off the trail and also to encourage people to use the trail uh, when passing through the area. So I'll turn it to the next slide now. Great. Uh, so just a couple final thoughts on this section. Um, so, uh, you know, we currently have a fairly auto-oriented and suburban corridor, but we do believe that with, you know, some modest investment, um, we are well positioned to be more vibrant and more walkable along the lines of, I think, what a lot of people have expressed a desire to see. Um, the uh, second point being that the placemaking process, which really involves conversations with all of you to understand how we really can improve and, ref and you know, have a better sense of identity that will be appealing to more shoppers and really allow us to become more vibrant um, is something that is, is essential to making a new vision for Henson Creek Village realized. Um, in addition, um, we, we are pleased that the county uh, is very much in support of this process and continued support from the county will be necessary to uh, realize some of the streetscaping and some of the flood protection improvements and some of the new amenities that we believe will be necessary to really make this village all that it can be. And then final point is that um, these kinds of conversations we're having are really important. And uh, we want to make sure that the outcome of this plan is really something that meets the needs and desires of all of you. Um, we, are, we are not, I saw a comment, we're, we're not developers, we are just planners. Um, but uh, our job is to really find, um, you know, the vision that will best meet all of your needs and not sort of impose something that we ourselves make up. So we're really glad to have all these comments and we look forward to more discussion later on. And I believe we might have a poll question next. All right, actually, so I'm, I'm thinking we, because we have so many questions here, I'd like to start with questions and maybe we'll end with a uh, quick chat question and a poll. Um, and so first of all, thank you to the H &R t a, HR and A team for their great presentation. Uh, and I, I'm also aware that you guys did a good job of answering some of the questions or comments that were in the, 
the chat already, uh, so that was very helpful. Uh, so the, the first question I'm gonna ask, and I'm gonna uh, allow you all to kind of sort out who's the best person to answer, but it comes from Christopher Napier and it says, is it possible to expand that emulation to Potomac, Maryland and Gainesville, Virginia? And I also saw in the chat, someone mentioned Tacoma Park. So, uh, you know, kind of beyond the, the, what you showed in the slide, are, are there other places that you might consider in the emulation? I can yeah. take a start. It, definitely, we can look at those other communities in terms of Tacoma Park, Potomac, and other areas uh, to find out if they might have any, you know, lessons learned or attributes that would be great to integrate into Henson Creek Village. Um, I will say that those areas also have their own uh, challenges, you know, even Potomac, Maryland, it essentially it's a a uh, handful of shopping centers around an intersection. I don't think it's the ideal in terms of walkability and you know a mixed use life. Uh, I think Tacoma Park is a great example in terms of the vibrancy uh, that exists in that community as well as the scale. Uh, so we can indeed look at some of those other examples and if you think of others that you want us to make sure we take a look at, uh, please post those in the chat as well. Right, and then we had a, a, a number of questions related to traffic both on um, Indian Head Highway and Livingston Road. So I may try and combine a couple here. So, uh, and the other thing I'll say is there were several questions relating to flooding and environmental issues. And if you just hold on tight, we've got another full pres presentation coming up on that. And we'll make sure we address those questions after we're done with that presentation. Uh, but the first, uh, I'm gonna ask two Livingston Road questions. So is Livingston Road going to be widened to accommodate the new traffic patterns that will be created by opening up this Henson Creek? And then there was a follow-up, um, actually uh, uh, two more for Livingston Road. Livingston Road is really busy during rush hours, drivers avoid 210, and there have been several accidents lately. So, you know, just the issue of uh, traffic volume, and then it's uh, also, I saw one other I thought uh, for, and that was from Charles Day. Uh, when, when you su tra suggest traffic is low of, for Livingston Road, do you take into account a specific time of day? And that came from Jocelyn Schmidt-Jones. So a number of concerns posed as questions with regard to Livingston Road. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to, to talk about that. Uh, so the, the number that you saw on the screen, about 5,200 cars a day, is what's called the average annual daily traffic count. It's basically taking traffic counts at different times of day and different times of year and creating an average out of that uh, to give an idea of how many, how many cars in general are using Livingston Road. Uh, that's a number from uh, the State Highway Administration and from Prince George's County. Um, that amount of cars is generally enough to be accommodated with two lanes and there are four lanes on the road now. Uh, I believe somebody did make a salient point about the lack of turn lanes. So one of the reasons why traffic might back up on Livingston Road now is because people are turning into one of the shops or businesses on either side. And when there's, you know, everyone's experience is that there's two through lanes and somebody stopped, you have to go, go around the car and merge back into traffic. And that creates a lot of delays. Uh, one of the one of the ways that we could address that, and I'm to be clear, this is an this is not an official proposal yet. Is other communities have done what's called a road diet, where they take a four lane road when there's two lanes in each direction, and they convert it into a three lane road, one through lane in each direction, and a center turn lane uh, that accommodates turns. So if you're going to make a left, you move over, and the people who are going straight can keep going straight. And even though it has a, a lower number of lanes, it can actually carry more traffic and reduce delays. And the number of cars on Livingston Road is well below the threshold uh, required to accommodate uh, a road diet. So that's, that is one possible way of looking at it. Um, and it's something that we're gonna explore in the, in the future. Great, and then we have a question um, about uh, Indian Head Highway, and I'm not, so I'm not sure, maybe it's someone from Chidi, your team. It says, Maryland State Highway is planning major road improvements to uh, Maryland 210. How do those plans affect the study area? And I'm not, I'm, I don't know if we know the answer to that, but if anyone has an answer or, or where we would get such an answer, that would be great. And Chidi, if you're gonna answer, you're gonna need to unmute.
Well, uh, when we were doing the uh, Hansen Creek Master Plan in 2005 or so, there was a proposal to make Indian Head Highway a limited, um, what do you call it? Limited, um, it's interchange on all those, uh, all those, all those points on Fort uh, for, 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 for Washington Road and also at Palmer Road. Right now, they are doing improvement somewhere. Like in the, they stopped uh, stop before Palmer Road. But I tried to find out from them exactly what the timeline is. But none of them, you know, the State Highway Administration has not given me any timeline. So they say it's still in a design stage or in conceptual stage. So right at this point, we may not be able to say anything until they get to a uh, conceptual and finish their conceptual and get into the design stage. But we will look into it and see what we can find, okay? So, Chidi, right. what you're referring to is uh, the State Highways Administration's desire to take out all of the lights heading down 210. Um, they're yes. currently at Kirby Hill Road, so you're seeing that flyover at this point. Um, and there is a plan, or at least, we're told that there is a plan to move down and continue that same thought process. So instead of uh, people turning uh, right at that Palmer Road uh, onto Livingston, uh, actually from 210 uh, towards the Max Sunny Brook and Harbor Mills, um, that that will become a flyover also. That's what's been um, reported will happen uh, and then at some point in time and then further down the same thing will happen right at Old Fort Road where the uh, the giant is and then Fort Washington Road and so on and so on um, but yeah you, you answered that correctly State Highway Administration used to have uh, an illustrative of what that was would look like and they've taken it down so I don't yeah, know they're taking it down they're not showing it anymore yes what? if they're redesigning that, but that's an excellent question. Obviously, if, if all of that is truncated, then there won't be any traffic coming on Livingston Road from 210, and that will alleviate, alleviate um, that traffic pattern. Great, um, thanks, Councilwoman. Um, so we, we have a couple of questions around the giant in Livingston Square. Uh, and so one, it's, it, it's uh, giant owns Livingston Square. So how does their vision align with what we're saying here? How do we bring them, them into this discussion? Another comment, uh, you know, re regarding Livingston Square, can the storyline be shared about H&R Realty, HR Realty, separate from HRNA, previously publishing plans to rebuild the property with a new giant? The story currently is that giant now owns Livingston Square, we need, we deserve to know kind of what's, what's really going on here. So I don't know who's best to speak to that, whether it's the consultant team or, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys sort it out. speak to Ahold, which is the owner of Giant, owns that site. And they're in the process of negotiating a sale of that site. Um, I am told that that negotiated sale term at least should be uh should be announced within the next couple of weeks um i will say this we uh district eight has reached out to giant uh, to come and speak to the community uh several times uh to no avail so they they have not been very responsive uh, uh, we've attempted to bring them into the conversation of what we might be able to do in a partnership to look at how that property could be developed. Um, but again, um, uh, they, it appears that they're choosing to sell that site and we're not quite sure what, um, what the plans will be, what the next plans will be. Uh, we can only speak on what we're, what we're hearing and um, none of that is confirmed. Right. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, th so there's a couple questions around um, kind of bike trail. So uh, one is kind of a statement and question. So it says the National Park Service has begun to study how to create the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. This trail will use the Henson Creek Trail and go through Broad Creek Woods and then along the Potomac by Harmony Hall. Talking about, you know, uh, kind of who's heading up that study with the National Park Service and that MMCPPC 
is involved, hopefully that you can join the study. And then someone else who says, don't know if this is the forum, but is this the correct place to submit the statement? It would be great if we had a bike trail that goes into the city, which would, which some of us would love to use to commute into the city and assuming that that would be going through this site. So uh, I, I, again, I realize these are connecting to things outside of the site, but the whole idea here is, you know, coherence and connectivity. And I don't know if anyone on the consultant team can respond to that to some degree. Dan, you want to talk a bit about uh, some of the bike issues? Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge in this community right now is you have this amazing trail network in the Henson Creek Trail, it goes for several miles. Uh, but there is no physical connection between it and Henson Creek Village. Um, right now, if you were to go between the trail and Livingston Road, if I understand correctly, you'd have to go up on Indian Head Highway and like ride along that for a while, which is at best unpleasant and at worst really unsafe. Um, and then on Livingston Road itself, you know, it, it's, uh, it can be a pretty busy and fast moving road. Uh, which also raises some safety issues. So you, one of the things that we're going to be looking at is how do we connect um, those two amenities, the Henson Creek Village itself to the Henson Creek Trail, um, and also how do we make the existing road network safer and more comfortable for bicyclists. Um, there are different ways we could do that. It could be uh, putting a facility on the road itself. It could be uh, putting like a path next to the road. Um, there are lots of different options that we'll be exploring throughout all of this. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, so next question, uh, so it says BCHD offers walkable space um, along the Potomac and access to four nationally registered historic assets. How does the plan bring these assets together? So again, it's kind of a connectivity and coherence across the district, uh, District 8. Uh, again, I, I, we've talked some about that uh, uh, a few days ago. Anyone want to kind of uh, talk about the historic assets and how this connects? Or I might can connect? kind of start. Um, and anybody who would like to is welcome to join. Um, we So the idea of the trail, firstly, being connected within Henson Creek Village is something we, we are very much in favor of, but also um, connectivity beyond. And, you know, we, we had the comment about DC. Um, comments about connecting to the waterfront trail along the Potomac. Um, those are a little bit outside of the immediate scope of, of this particular assignment, but we very much are in support of all of those sorts of ideas. Um, and so, you know, whether or not we end up with a bike tra trail that goes directly to some of those historic assets, although again, that's a great idea, um, we certainly believe that it is important to have connectivity in other ways. And those other ways could include Again, um, drawing inspiration from some of the heritage around this area, um, whether that means, you know, the look and feel of some of the streetlights or the, the benches um, or some of the storefronts, um, having a little bit more reference to this really great architectural heritage that we have in the area um, is a way to kind of connect, even if we don't necessarily have, you know, perfect uh, pedestrian and perfect bike trails to every single one of those assets, although again, in theory, that would suit me just fine. I would be supportive. Um, but again, a little bit of beyond this, the scope of this particular assignment, but a very interesting idea. Great. So I'm going to ask uh, one more combined set of questions around safety, and then I'm going to move us quickly to a chat question, a polling question, and then we'll move to our final presentation. So the, so there's there were two questions that I saw. There's, there may be more around safety. So it says, how do we manage this redevelopment? while creating and enforcing a safe community. This area has been notorious for many shootings and stabbings. A second one is more about traffic safety. What plans are in place or will be put in place to sustain the more upscale projections for the area, especially related to safety on 210 and personal safety? So, you know, that, that may be a combined question, both consultants and uh, councilwoman or uh, MNCPPC. So let me see who wants to respond first. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to, to punt to um, Go for it. the, oh, okay. the, uh, the county um, leadership and staff on the specific safety issues here. But one thing I just wanted to lead off with is, you know, the vision we have for this corridor is that there will be more vitality, more people walking on sidewalks and enjoying nice, pleasant strolls and walking into stores, potentially, you know, having, uh, you know, apartments above certain uh, storefronts. Um, and what that ends up doing 
uh, just in terms of safety as a general principle, is you have, you know, more activity, more eyes on the street, um, and it becomes a less, uh, you know, a, a less welcoming place for those who are maybe with, with alternate uh, desires, um, who, you know, who may be associated with some of, you know, the crime that, that was mentioned in the comment. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't want to speak to that specific situation here, but what I can say is the more you have people walking around and the more you have people feeling comfortable, and the more you have activity in the open space and people sitting on benches and walking on sidewalks, um, the more uh, any crime particular issues are likely to be tempered. And that's kind of a general planning principle that really applies around the country. When you have more activity, some safety concerns, which appear when there's less, you know, less activity and uh, more emptiness and fewer eyes, um, the, the more those uh, tend to, to tamper down just a little bit. And any, anyone else want to address just the safety because there was the, the issue around crime, which I think, uh, Alex, you did a really nice job of answering. And there was also just the issue around traffic safety and the juxtaposition with 210. And I will speak on uh, 210. Uh, many of you know that um, uh, I created with my team a hashtag driving at home uh, campaign. Hashtag driving at home. And the whole point is to uh, look at those things that um, are you know, central to being safe. Keep your eyes on the road. You know, don't talk uh, on your phone, um, you know, while you're driving. Uh, but what we're attempting to do, and you've probably seen the signs if you're in the area at every high school, and that is to put the tenants of that up. Um, the expectation is that over time, uh, the culture will change. You know, you can't really change behavior. You can get people to slow down um, if they see a speed camera, but if their instinct is to speed up once they're out of range, then you haven't really changed the culture. You've just temporarily gotten somebody to do something uh, because they felt that there was a threat. There needs to be a feeling of, um, we need to, to change the culture so that we're all safe. And that's just gonna take time. That's whether it's 210, 495, uh, 301, um, 85 South, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's the culture, the driving culture that we're really working on. So that's the only way I can really address that safety, uh, that safety issue there. Yeah, and, it's, and it's tied to the county and the region's vision zero plans, right? I mean, this is, an, this is an issue everywhere, right? All right, so we're going to do a quick, so I'm going to ask folks to put um, stuff in the chat. And so let me just pull up the chat question. So uh, it, the, the question is, what was notable or what most resonated for you as you listened to the overall presentation from HRNA? What was notable? And I know folks have already been um, typing comments and questions in the chat box. As you may have seen, mostly I took the questions that were submitted from the actual Q&A uh, queue that I've got, not from the chat. So what was most notable or most resonated for you? And let's see what your, some of your responses are. So go ahead, put your comments in the chat. What most resonated with you? Bringing the Fort Washington area into the 21st century. We're only 20, 20 years in, that's all right. What else? I know you guys have been chatting all night. Are there, you know, or maybe you've already kind of exhausted yourselves with, with, with things that you saw in the, the presentation. Focus on upscale housing, cycling access, with uh, lots of exclamation points, potentially conflicting uses, environment and high density residential, in the absence of transportation solutions, giant isn't coming back as promised, impressed with the level of detail and being in sync with most of the community's concerns, uh, key, kind of the coordination of 210 improvement and interconnecting with uh, National Harbor. Uh, the road diet, people see that as really important. Uh, the need for walking, biking, and everything that accompanies that. Uh, a vision that would add value of homes uh, and ability to enjoy offerings in the neighborhood. Uh, and then some other comparisons. So thank you very much. Again, we will be capturing all of this uh, as we uh, go along. Uh, so I'm going to ask one uh, one more poll, and then we're going to move to the environmental uh, presentation. So um, 
Let me pull up that poll. All right, so this is asking you, so you heard about a lot of things both in the survey and you heard it in, in terms of the HRNA presentation. There's eight things here, eight, one being uh, other. When you think about what you'd really like to see, especially from a retail perspective, you have the opportunity here to choose your top three. Uh, and so uh, take a look at this list, evaluate it, find the ones, and you get to click on the, th the three different options that you believe uh, are the most important here for us to consider. So I'm gonna leave this open for a little while because I know there's a bunch of options that you're evaluating. Want to encourage people to keep taking the poll. I know we've got we've got now a hundred people who are participating in this meeting. That's great to reach the century mark. I'll give you another ten seconds, and then we'll close out and see where we are. Looks like about uh, a little less than half have responded so far. Five seconds. Four, three, two, one. People are still jamming on the polling here but I'm gonna close it just in the interest of time. And we'll share the results. So uh, we actually had a tie and interestingly, it's the, it's the two top ones we saw in the survey. So healthy food, healthy grocery store, healthy food, health food grocery store and a sit down restaurant. 81% uh, of you said that, similar to what we heard uh, again in the, the survey, but then a kind of a standard large grocery store, almost half of you, uh, about a quarter of you home and garden store, another quarter of you, uh, actually about a fifth of you takeout or fast casual, uh, and about a quarter of you saying other. So if, if, uh, if you feel like we haven't heard what the other is, uh, the best thing to do would be to uh, type in the chat what some of those other things are that don't end up on this polling list just so we make sure that we capture that going forward. So thanks again for taking that poll. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask uh, our environmental consultants, KCI, both Timothy Miller and Adam Islam, uh, to take it away and sharing what the, the scope for the environmental analysis is on this project. Tim, Adam. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, Thank you, Councilwoman Anderson Walker. Thank you everyone for joining us here tonight um, on this very important topic and very important project that we have brought um, to be a part of. Um, so we'll begin with the first slide. So we were asked to do the um, environmental study uh, within this area of the Livingston Road, Henson Creek Village. And what we would like to do is we would like to address the flooding as you, as you guys are aware within this area and to address the stormwater issues within the study area and the surrounding areas. Um, we would like to explore a potential to energize, which I think is a great word, the Henson Creek Stream Valley Park as a regional recreational feature and, and to keep it as a destination place for people that are coming to explore the area and the surrounding communities. Um, for those of you who are new to the terminology, I just wanna go over some quick definitions. Um, you know, you guys, um, most of you have heard of FEMA flood maps, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and they create different rates, uh, different maps um, to um, uh, talk about locations of flooding in terms of um, buying potential insurance on the property. We have uh, stormwater management, which is uh, a hot topic right now. And, you know, we're talking about both quantity and quality control um, for the treatment of pollutions for the treatment of pollutants before it enters uh, larger bodies of stream water. Um, we have wetlands, um, as some of you might know, wetlands slow the speed of the flood waters that we have and distribute them more slowly over floodplains. So they are very important to our ecosystem and our ecology and just the overall environment. Um, another terminology is uh, water, water of the waters of the United States. Um, Henson Creek Stream is within the um, body of the water of the United States, and it is managed by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, along with the Army Corps of Engineers. 
um, their job is to ensure that there's navigable waterways um, uh, within these intermittent streams. Um, one more thing I would like to point out is the um, NOAA Atlas uh, rainfall event. So as you guys might know, you hear about the one year, two year, 10, 100 year storms. And these are basically the intensity or the um, inches of rainfall that you receive within a 24 hour period. Rainfall intensity is a direct correlation with the runoff and um, storm water management practices. Um, if we go to the next slide, Steve. Uh, thank you. So um, I would like to begin a little bit about what's the history of storm water management in Prince George's County. So prior to 1980, storm water management was not required at all for either quantity or quality treatments. Um, Congress with, um, during 1980 passed the Clean Water Act which brought down further regulations on how to treat pollutants before it enters larger bodies of water. The US EPA granted Prince George's County a NPDES MS4, which is a pollutant discharge system permit, um, to regulate the stormwater management and to ensure that there is a reduction of erosion, silt, biological oxygen demand, pollutants, um, things of that nature before it enters into streams and rivers. Um, between 1980 and 2000, um, quantity control was required for the two and the 10, 10 year storms. Um, from 2000 onwards, the focus changed more from quantity control to quality control with uh, only a one year storm um, quantity control uh, management. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what quality and quantity control is in the upcoming slides. Um, however, it is important to note that in 2019, a bill was introduced to manage the 100 year storm in nearly 75% of the watershed in Prince George's County, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the upcoming slides. Um, I would also like to uh, mention that all of the apartments that we see that, that occurred with along Palmer Road um, that you see now today, that was all created prior to stormwater management regulations. And we'll see some pictures of how stormwater management tied in with the community and where we are today. Um, if we go to the next slide. So talking a little bit more about the MS4 permit or the, um, the NPDES permit that, that, that is within Prince George's County. So the emphasis on this permit is more of a quality control. So we use things such as filter media, such as the soil, different types of stone, number 57, number, number two stone, sand, um, in order to filter out pollutants before it is able to enter into the storm drains and then eventually enter into stream bodies. Um, Back in the days, they used to use large ponds um, in order to hold and hold all of this water, um, run, run off water. Um, but no longer do they use the large ponds. They use more or less the smaller ponds like the microbioretention facilities. You have shallow gravel wetlands. Um, you have uh, swales and green roofs, things of that nature. Uh, other filter medias um, are used now. These would remove um, items such as straw, cigarette butts, trash, litter, and more, um, in order, more the things that are filtered within the, um, the permit itself. Uh, going to the next slide, we, we see that uh, the EPA has actually set standards on how to manage your TMDL, your total maximum daily load, um, before, it in, before entering into water bodies. You know, some, some things they might do is they may, may, may require two rows of, of silt fence instead of one if they feel that, you know, it's not collecting enough pollutants. And, um, you know, over time, they, 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 the EPA have studied the, the, um, the effects of the permit and how they can improve it. And they noticed that controlling one off um, and the, the 210 and the 100 year storm has a direct correlation with helping with the downstream flooding and um, just management of the overall um, stream body itself. Um, going to the next slide. So looking at the Henson Creek Village study area, the area that we were selected to have a focus on, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have a lot of thoughts about this area. So we were just trying to figure out where, where we were with this area and what, what type of amenities that we have. So, there's 240 acres within this study area, just to show the gravity of what it is that we're dealing with. We see that the trail is located um, in red um, next to the single family homes. The trail itself follows the stream all the way northbound, um, all the way up to Camp Springs, as I'll show in the upcoming slides. Um, uh, in terms of the trail itself, 
you know, we mentioned that you're walking to the trail because of a lack of connections, lack of trailheads. Um, you know, there, there, there's lack of parking within this area. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what it is that we're dealing with both for the trail and for the stream itself in the upcoming slides. Um, if we go to some pictures now, so we were able to, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, you know, have experiences within this area where we were just trying to um, bring in some pictures to understand what it is that we're dealing with in terms of the flooding and the inundation, you know, and we see that there is high levels of inundation of the water. Um, you see small streams, um, you see high velocities of water that's just rushing down streams um, towards the swales. You know, there is um, inability to maintain infiltration within the, uh, within the soil itself. You know, it's just creating small rivers within these small creeks and it's just, you know, um, overtaxing the system. Um, if we notice that there's potholes, you know, starting to develop along the roadways due to the water destroying the pavement, you know, it's causing structural failure. There's alligatoring of the pavement due to all of the high standing water. Um, you know, these are structural failures which has a lot of cost implications, has a lot of, um, you know, intent. So we just see there's just an intense amount of water in just a short amount of time. And it's just, you know, all along this area, um, Oxton Hill, Fort Washington. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to figure out what it is that we can do in order to mitigate this problem. So going back into the Henson Creek Trail itself, and I know we talked a little bit about this with HRNA. Um, so just to give some key highlights, you know, there is 5.7 total miles from Fort Washington to Camp Springs. And the trail itself begins along Oxen Hill Road. Um, and it is within our study area and it goes um, uh, northbound through the communities and it passes different uh, locations such as the Tucker Road Community Center. We have the athletic complex. Um, we have na neighborhood parks. Um, we have the Henson Creek Golf Stream and it it goes all the way up towards uh, Temple Hills community. Um, in terms of connectivity, the only place that you can actually access the trail within this study area is along um, Oxen Hill Road. You go southbound on Livingston Road, make a, make a right, and then right there is the traffic, um, there is the trailhead. Um, and then in terms of parking, so the only parking that we studied and found within this area was along Tor Bryan Road, and I believe it's Hard Lane. And um, there is a small little parking area there, but you have to go through all throughout the community in order to access that parking. And um, I know that Dan Reed of h &R was mentioning earlier about ideas on how to improve the um, connectivity and access to the trail so that, um, you know, more people within this community can use this beautiful trail in order to access everything that is going uh, northbound. Um, so moving forward. Um, okay, so just talk a little bit more about where we, how we came to this point, basically, you know, history you know, and photos are, you know, uh, just amazing to show you, you know, where, where, where uh, this community is going. So starting off in 1938, we see those two little lines. Um, that is actually Highway 210 that we showed here today. Um, that did not exist, obviously, back in the days. It was just that small uh, road. So there was not much development back then. 1965, we see the development starting to really come on board here. You know, you see the apartments along the east side, along Palmer Road, um, starting, to be, uh, starting to be built. The salvage yard um, that is along Livingston Road, that is already in place. Um, it is important to note that in 1965, there was no such thing as stormwater management law. So, you know, just development just happened as they saw fit. 1980, um, the, study area, the study area that we see here today is almost pretty much developed. Livingston Square Shopping Plaza, we see is already in place and it's important to note that's in 1980. Going, in, going forward to 2018, we see that there's no real major changes from 1980 to from what we have today. Um, that's just kind of how the history of this entire community is, uh, has brought us here today. Um, going to the next slide. So just let me just to interrupt for a minute. I just want to remind people to please put your questions in the Q&A box because we'll be doing another Q&A uh, as soon as we're done with this presentation. Sorry, Adam, go ahead. Okay. Um, so just talking a little bit more about what is the FEMA floodplain map and how does it relate to this community and where we stand with it today. So the FEMA floodplain map is basically for insurance purposes. It is so that if your property is within this area, you're allowed to get flood insurance at a reduced rate after certification. 
Um, also within your floodplain map, you know, they require you to have your buildings two feet above the floodplain so that it has less impact on the property and the, the flood waters. Um, generally, uh, it is most, most of the time flooding is caused by the upstream development and, you know, HRNA did talk a little bit more about development that happened upstream and where we're headed with this and what, what's, our, what's actually in place. Um, it's also important to note that WSSC is a important um, organization in this area. They manage the water and the sewer. And we have studied and realized that a lot of these WSSC manholes are over top. You know, they, they, it, the system is just overtaxed. The pipelines aren't able to handle it. And, you know, sometimes you see spillovers occur. So um, that is a direct uh, correlation from the flooding that happens in this area. The area in blue that we see here is everywhere that's within your 1% chance of flooding, your 100-year floodplain. Um, we noticed that there is um, arrows. Obviously, the arrows show where the downstream um, of the water is going. And if you look at the next slide, we, that shows a little bit more. Um, Steve, we'll go to the next slide. So we have what's called a county floodplain map. So county floodplain map and the FEMA floodplain map is pretty much similar, except that the county floodplain map is more surveyed by actual surveyors in the fleet field. And again, we noticed that a lot of the study area is within the floodplain. You know, and then there is areas in the north that's also within the floodplain. And if you expand it even further, you know, it, 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 a lot of this area does correlate and go come from the north, north, uh, northeast development and the northeast um, sector. Um, one thing we did notice when talking to MNCPPC is that they have a tough time managing the flooding that's occurring in this area. You know, they see a lot of built up of silt and stream erosion in this area, just because of the um, location of it being downstream. Um, you know, that's, that, that's, that's, that's just how the um, drainage area falls and it all ends up within this small concentration of the drainage area before it eventually ends up into the Potomac River. Um, I did notice that um, one important thing, the, the church, uh, St. John's Episcopal Church is located at the bottom of the map um, it's a little bit outside of our study area, but it is important to note that it is completely within the, um, the county floodplain. And one, one key um, fact that I realized or that I heard was that this church was frequently attended by the first president of the United States, George Washington. So, you know, there is a lot of history in this area and, you know, we would like to preserve, maintain, and just, you know, just keep this area um, a historic uh, designation for the people um, for, for, for the coming years. For the coming years. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so just talking a little bit more about the stormwater management uh, control in Prince George's County. Um, back in 2019, uh, we again, I mentioned that we had uh, legislation that passed, passed um, in terms of managing your 100-year flooding. So everywhere that you see here in, in yellow is um, it's about 75% of Prince George's County now requires 100-year stormwater management um, for the design and of any future development projects. Um, as you notice, we have that small circle that says our site. So basically everything in terms of watersheds are working together in order to enter into this Livingston Square circle. So it just gives you a, a brev, uh, like gravity of where we are in terms of just the geographical location um, of this area. So. Uh, that, that is a major step forward, you know, design engineers have to evaluate downstream flooding, um, you know, and, and, and manage stormwater management, taking into account the 100 year storms. Um, just talk, talking a little bit more about where we are right now, um, looking at the registered stormwater management facilities um, within the Prince George's County De Department of the Environment itself. We noticed that there is a lack of stormwater management facilities already in this area. The only thing that we found was a oil grit separator, which is sort of like a septic tank. Um, but other than that, there is nothing else to exist. Off to the west, we noticed that there's a lot of dry wells, retention ponds, um, other flood management uh, retention ponds. But um, given the fact that this was a early developed area, they did not allow a lot of stormwater management to occur in this area. So, hey, Tim, can I just jump in for a second? Um, so you're saying in this 240 acre uh, area that there is one 
stormwater system? Yes. So, so from our records, yeah. yes, from our records of what we found from the Prince Charles County DOE, um, there is only one registered stormwater management facility that is located within this Livingston Road area. And obviously going forward, if any redevelopment or projects that need development occur, they will be required to do stormwater management. That is what we were told. So what is normal to you in a 240 acre area like this? What would be uh, acceptable now for well, stormwater systems? Yeah, so if we look right off to, I mean, we can look right off to the, the, west, the, the west of all of the properties and the single family homes, you know, the, pretty much every development would have some sort of management system, whether it's a detention, pond, whether it's underground storage, whether it is, um, you know, some sort of um, microbiome retention facility. So you would see a lot more than what we see now. I, I pretty much every single development would have um, some sort of management system registered with uh, DPI. Right. So it's just, you know, prior to 1980, there was no actual regulations on stormwater management. And, and as we saw some pictures, a lot of this development just happened you know, prior to any of those regulations going into place. So that's just how, you know, this, this area was developed. Um, okay, so going to the next slide. Um, so I know I mentioned, you know, a lot, of, a lot about like where we, where we are, where we're headed um, in terms of just overall stormwater. But, you know, I'm here to say that there is room for potential future improvements in this area. Um, as we noticed, a lot of the drainage area comes, you know, directly through the stream that cuts right through the study area. So that stream is very important in terms of management of floodwaters. And um, so it's just how do we manage the stream in terms of improving its riparian um, design in order to reduce the flooding. Um, a lot of the streams have meandering effects which cause um, erosion. So we would like to um, suggest ways on how to straighten um, the alignment of the streams, um, how to uh, armor some of the stream banks. Um, this will just help to um, allow with the channelization of the stream itself. Um, and another way we can do it that I mentioned earlier was through the uh, use of wetlands. Wetlands are very, very important within uh, e uh, ecosystem just because of how the ability of the direct correlation on how, how it can affect the, the floodwaters um, in terms of water quality and flood control. Um, maybe there's ways of introducing new wetlands within this area. Um, you know, that's just something that would need to be looked at by um, surrounding um, properties and surrounding communities. Um, if we go to the next slide, I want to touch a little bit more about the riparian improvements that we were able to suggest. Um, we have here root wad placements, um, root wad placements, soil stabilization mating, and imbricated riprap. Just talk a little bit about that. Those are methods to help prevent stream bank erosion. Um, you know, they, they help to armor up the stream bank in order to kind of keep the water within the channel itself instead of spilling out over, over the adjacent roadways. Um, that's just another way to help uh, allow to straighten the stream. We have cross veins and rock veins, which also help to um, direct the flow of the water in order to avoid meandering. Um, it helps to um, improve the low flow channels in order to kind of create um, waterways for them to actually uh, Im improve and to avoid bank erosion. So everything, all of this, all of these um, improvements just kind of tied together, um, utilizing it within different areas of the Henson Creek stream both within the study area and both upstream will definitely help to, you know, it, it will definitely help to uh, improve the area and improve the stream and the overall, um, just the health and longevity of the, of the area itself. Um, going to the next slide, um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Tim Miller, who will talk a little bit more about other uh, case studies in this area. Thank you, Adam. I know that was a lot to get in a few minutes. Um, in summary, there's numerous communities that uh, have found ways to improve their quality of life and their environmental surroundings, some being like the city of Frederick, uh, the city of Laurel, the Anacostia Riverfront, and others pictured in the screen above. They've either done this through uh, adding art to the community, 
uh, and their waterfronts, uh, interpretive signage. Uh, City of Laurel has a large dam that was once constructed above the city. Um, they use that as a walkway and there's a boardwalk up to that dam. Um, and it relates to a lot of the history of the City of Laurel. Um, that made uh, that was primarily used to power the mills that was used to spin cloth for ships that would come into uh, Elkridge, Maryland for repairs and things of that nature. Um, as time goes on, KCI is going to explore regulations to control flooding like that has occurred in Ellicott City. Um, they've actually gone beyond the requirement of 100 year management which is a 1% storm to handle storms that are very similar to a uh, extreme summer thunderstorm. And by implementing those controls, they hope to reduce the flooding and again, bring back life into the city of uh, Ellicott City. Um, other items related to regulations include uh, studies in Washington, D.C. has recently adopted regulations that require the updating of stormwater management facilities to meet current regulations. So if you've heard through the, the report, basically a lot of these facilities that are properties were developed prior to stormwater management. D.C. has regulations into effect that basically require property owners related to apartment buildings, commercial establishments, things of that nature, that when they knock down a building or they renovate that building to a certain extent, if there's renovations that exceed 50% of the interior units to an apartment complex, you're required to bring the stormwater management, storm drain, water quality and quantity controls up to par with current regulations. So we'll look into those items and again we'll present those items in the coming weeks for our next presentation to occur I believe in November and they'll also appear in our uh, final report. So again um, we know that it was a lot to get in in a few minutes and uh, but thank you very much. Steve? Uh, thank you, Tim and Adam. So we're going to open it up to Q&A. I know the Q&A box has been very busy, although I have not been able to um, track it during the presentation, but I'm going to take a few questions here. Um, so, um, so one person says, how quickly will infrastructure be put in place to avoid the flooding of our properties? And I'm sure that's a tough question to answer since we're still in the study phase, but uh, clearly, flooding is a major concern of, of uh, residents in the area. Well, we do know that there is a current study um, that's just in, it's just started, um, that State Highway is looking at uh, as improving the stream flow through this area. Basically, beginning at the bridge, which is to the, that crosses 210, Indian Head Highway to the north, and they're looking at ideas to, um, again, reduce the flooding by, as Adam mentioned, some of these riparian methods, um, installing those to help the flow through the study area. Um, again, it, what you're trying to do is possibly reduce the friction of water filling up and running through woods and running through brush and trying to keep more of these flows within the stream banks um, by lining streams with stone and things of that nature. Um, again, it'll speed up the flow and it'll reduce the width of the floodplain um, as it affects the community and things of that nature. Great, thanks Tim. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Kim from NCPPC, uh, MNCPPC, I'm sorry, MNPPC, uh, is with us as well. Uh, Kim, I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on, on this before I move on to the next question. And if you do, you're on mute. And if you don't, I can just move on to the next question. Steve, can you unmute her? 
Uh, let me see if I can do that. Um, I will try, I, I don't see her listed in my list here. So um, let me move on to the next question. And while that question's being answered, I'll see if I can unmute you, Kim, sorry about that. Um, so uh, there's a question from Jocelyn with 100 year storm events occurring more often now, what's the plan to manage development and how does the county conduct a quality check to make sure it is done? So that may be more of a uh, parks and planning question. Well, how I can answer. Sounds like an engineering nope. question to me. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Tim. It does. Um, basically, 100 year management, we have to submit plans as an engineering firm that are reviewed by the county. Um, the, the specific office is called DPI, um, and they have engineers that will review the engineer's designs for compatibility then those facilities are constructed in the field. And right now you have to construct those facilities per the approved plan. Those facilities are then checked, okay? So when I mean checked, you physically have to go out and survey those facilities. They're signed and sealed by a licensed surveyor. Those plans are then turned back into DPI and checked to make sure that the facility, if this facility was supposed to be 100 feet long and five feet deep, then DPI goes ahead and confirms the surveyor's measurements and things of that nature. They may even have, and in most cases do, have inspectors that are present out in the field viewing these uh, facilities as they're installed. So you do have a lot of quality uh, checks that are put in place by the county. Um, again, as filts have to be submitted and those all have to be signed and sealed by a licensed engineer. Great, thanks uh, Tim, appreciate that. So um, there's a question here from uh, Tanique Jenkins. What is the anticipated effect to the neighborhoods that are downstream of this area? I'm, I was, you know, what, once we start doing things in this study area, what would be the anticipated effect on them? Well, we would anticipate uh, if these items are implemented um, in this, just in this study area that you would see less flooding down in the church area, in the Broad Creek area. Um, again, we would hope that a lot of these items might be implemented uh, to existing properties upstream. Um, you know, to best manage the pro you know, the, the problem. Um, it, primarily, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, trail erodement um, upstream along the Henson Creek Golf Course caused by a lot of this water. So it's not in our specific study area, but it's within this whole watershed that you know basically needs to have these items implemented um, to stop the erosion. Uh, park and planning has, uh, you know, over the years, um, a tree falls down uh, along the edge of the stream, the head or the main branches of the stream will actually block flows. And after some, some of these summer thunderstorms, we've seen a stream shift 50 feet, 100 feet. Um, it may move the stream away from one of their trails, or it may go ahead and drive the, the floodwaters into their trails where they lose the pavement, lose access, things of that nature. So again, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry for, Stepping, I just I think you're answering wonderful questions. I, I know that uh, this area in particular um, has had a lot of flooding, and if you could speak to just with your vast knowledge of uh, why flooding might occur, uh, maybe based on not only this immediate area that you're studying, but um, you spoke to upstream uh, issues. Could you go a little bit deeper into that and um, and kind of educate people as to why they might be 
why they might be getting flooding in their area, why yeah. this area gets the, uh, the brunt of the flooding. It is. I mean, there, there's several, this area gets the brunt of the flooding because it is at the low end of the watershed, okay? Um, upstream of the watershed, a lot of the areas were developed prior to 1984 when stormwater management was enacted by the Maryland legislation, or under Maryland legislation. Um, back then, um, you know, in 1984, uh, we started to control that flooding, but because a lot of these facilities were built prior to 1984, there was no legislation ever enacted to try and go back and retrofit those areas that don't have stormwater management. It continues. Um, in 2019, as Adam mentioned, 75% um, of the county, they realized that there was a problem. And therefore, 75% of the county is now required to manage the 100-year storm, as well as water quality. Um, that will certainly help in new developments, but the major problem exists as how do you go back and retrofit some of these communities? Um, there is, and I believe Prince George's may spend, you may know better than me, Councilwoman, um, I believe they spend close to $3 million a year from their rain tax um, to build new facilities, things of that nature throughout the county. Um, there are different items related to grants um, to help or assist, say an apartment complex or a, uh, a car lot to implement new stormwater management facilities and um, where they may receive some funding if they're so willing to do that. And that's basically where the bulk of the problem is. Um, this area is also underlain by gravel and sand deposits. As everyone knows, a lot of this area has been mined uh, for sand and gravel over the years. And these stream banks are, you know, constructed of uh, sand and gravel, which nowadays, you know, with these high flows, becomes more erodible. Yeah. Can you, can you also speak to development and floodplains uh, in the north and how that may affect this area? Well, floodplains, um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, I'll say this, Army Corps of Engineers, it's my understanding that the Army Corps of Engineers and FEMA uh, recommend that there is never development in a floodplain. But in this county, we have allowed development in floodplains. Uh, there's a uh, discussion that's always, we will bring it out of the floodplain. I think even in the discussions we had here, it was, you know, elevated two feet uh, above where you are, above the floodplains to, to lessen the probability. Uh, that doesn't take away the fact that there's a floodplain. What it does is it pushes those waters and the acres of water. Mm -hmm. Don't let me put words in your mouth. I want you to go with it. You're right. But this is my understanding. You're right. So, you know, when, when one decides to uh, give a waiver for a, um, a subdivision to be built in a floodplain, uh, that will likely, we will get the brunt of that. Correct. Because That's those correct. waters will flow. And yeah. these are things that are happening. I think that uh, as a community, we need to be aware of not just what's happening in our watershed, but what's happening within the county that will eventually impact this watershed for the reasons that um, Tim Miller mentioned. I'm going to let you finish uh, your presentation and your, your discussion, but I think those are pertinent issues. When people do have flooding, it's severe and it is uh, detrimental to our values. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have been in, in, in office for almost two years and, you know, our focus is um, we want people to live in a vibrant community. We want people to, uh, we want to have a transformative effects uh, in a positive way on people's lives. So um, there's a recognition that something's got to give here. We can't continue to allow even development somewhere else that we know mm -hmm. is going to have an adverse impact because it, it strips away wealth down here. And when you can't sell your house because it's flooded over and over and over again, that's stripping away your wealth. Yes, it is. Um, and that's a crime. Uh, but 
that's a whole nother day. Uh, I appreciate your being here. Please continue with, um, with your enlightening, um, lightning responses and, and please continue Steve with uh, with these questions that uh, people yeah, so, have we'll, patiently uh, waited to have answered. Yes, thank, thanks Councilwoman. So, uh, you know, there, there's a, both comments and questions we're seeing here. So, uh, you know, someone says here, clear the mouth of bridges clogged with debris. Uh, another person says, painful discussion while outside the study area. One of the stormwater retention plans is proposed to be built as a Jiffy Loop facility at Swan Creek in 210. So, now, clearly, you know, there are issues both inside and outside the site that are impacting and people are highly aware of that. Um, but I want to I want to ask three hopefully fairly quick questions. Um, so one is I walked Henson Creek a week ago. I smelled sewer like odor. How will this change as development adds non permeable surfaces? Or how is it would it be intended to change? As they add non permeable surfaces. What happens is what you're getting or generally getting is there may be sewage overflows um, caused by flooding, caused by infiltration into the sewage system by high flows. You get flows that exceed a manhole um, and they may tend to flow in. I know WSSC does take a lot of initiative to put uh, liners inside of manholes and things of that nature nowadays that may be susceptible to flooding to prevent extraneous water from entering those systems. Um, but then again, you still have it. Um, a lot of these pipes were built, you know, when the communities were built 70 years ago. And back then they used things such as terracotta piping that a lot of us will see. It's an orange pipe. It was made out of fired clay and as time goes on, tree roots get in there, things of that nature, pry apart those parts of pipe, and you may have leaching of sewage into the uh, streams and, and groundwater. Um, nowadays, we, those pipes that they used back then were generally maybe four feet in length. Today, um, requirements of WSSC require plastic pipe which has joints every 20 feet. So, you know, you've taken five joints of this terracotta pipe that may be four feet and you insert a 20 foot piece of PVC pipe. Um, and again, it eliminates the ability for roots to enter that. Um, it holds up a lot better. And that may be something that needs to be done. And that's where some of the smell may, may be coming from. Um, so you're saying, Tim, that, that uh, as this site gets redeveloped, those are the kinds of issues that would need to be addressed in, to change the piping underground and such. Correct. Correct. Because uh -huh. as, as you pave a street or you renovate a street, if Livingston Road uh, were to be updated, if State Highway gets in here and does renovate uh, Indian Head Highway, you know, if they're going to put new pavement, new bridges, things of that nature in there, a lot of times you'll see new infrastructure, new water lines, new sewer lines, new gas lines go in before they actually go ahead and make these improvements. That's to make sure that what goes in underneath the ground doesn't have to be dug up at a later time for water line breaks, sewage breaks, things of that nature, and it's new. And then they go ahead and build that new road on top of it. Um, and let me just go back to one other question that the councilwoman brought up. Um, nowadays, uh, when you go ahead and build in a floodplain, there is a requirement. So if I go ahead and build in a floodplain, I'm displacing water. Picture a boat, you know, going down in the water and that displaces a certain amount of water that may move water onto my neighbor upstream. Um, it may cause or worsen the condition downstream of my neighbor. Um, but the county is requiring now that you do something called compensatory storage. Okay, compensatory storage means that you have to possibly um, dig out that area you know, excavate for the volume that you've put in to the floodplain. So it, it's, it's generally a one-for-one -one, um, displacement. Um, 
I know that there are some areas that we're seeing a lot of this occur um, up into Chevrolet and Hyattsville, things of that nature right now, where there is uh, compensatory storage uh, items being taken to offset you know, any effects to downstream properties, things of that nature. So that is one way to do it um, through compensatory storage. But again, you're, you're introducing maybe more paving, more roofed areas. Those areas have to be taken care of by stormwater management requirements. Yep. Right. So Tim, I'm going to ask a few more questions. I know we're getting close to the 830 hour and I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. Um, so one question is uh, whether developers will be penalized if they are not adhering to the new flooding requirements. I'm sure Councilman, well, <laughs> well, I'm sure, um, you know, the, the, the law is the law. If you break the law and you get caught, you're going to pay a, a fine, a penalty of some sort. Um, yeah. And those are all included in regulations. If, if, you know, if you don't provide stormwater management, it, your plans aren't even going to get through the county for approval nowadays. Yes. Okay. Uh, is there a short term plan to fix parts of the Henson Creek Trail that are currently fully eroded and impassable? I know that we have worked on certain areas, um, installing some of those riparian features that Adam was talking about earlier on eroded portions of the trail. Um, I believe some of those areas were just to the north um, in that behind that apartment complex. Um, I believe that's Palmer Road. And, um, you know, I know that Park and Planning, when they notice this, uh, you know, degradation, uh, they're, they're well aware of it. They have people that drive those trails weekly, um, check on them, things of that nature. And I know that they're doing their part um, to try to maintain them as best possible. But they're, they're in the sit same situation as the community um, you know, uh, it's a problem that is basically off-site and they do more, they have to react to it um, because they aren't building, you know, new impervious areas on their sites that would, you know, require stormwater management. I know, I believe it's the Tucker Ice Rink that is upstream from this project and that is, you know, that's being renovated and 100 year management is being provided for that site. So they are doing their part as they renovate and build new facilities. Um, but again, it's it, you have the apartments and commercial areas that haven't been renovated and brought up to current standards. Yeah. Great. So um, I've been asked to wrap this up. Um, as we're beginning to wrap up, I'm gonna ask folks to um, uh, quickly put in the chat around the environmental uh, uh, presentation just heard, whether there's something that new that you learned just about some of the dynamics and mechanics of, of, of uh, what's in place, what's not in place, what needs to be in place. Would love to hear your thoughts about that. While you're doing that, I am going to um, move to some next steps and ask the councilwoman uh, to to share her final thoughts. So so first of all, thank you to Adam and Tim from KCI Technologies for a great presentation and uh, uh, kind of thorough responses to questions. Uh, obviously, we did not get uh, to answer close to uh, the, the sheer number of questions that we had. Lots of rich questions, lots of rich comments. Really appreciate that. And we'll look at, at uh, ways of addressing those after this meeting. Uh, but what you can expect in the next couple of months uh, as we uh, get ready for our next community meeting, which you see in the bottom bullet, will be November 18th in a very similar format to what you see tonight. Uh, by then, we will have a draft economic and market analysis report that will build upon the findings that the HRNA team uh, shared tonight uh, and go beyond that. Uh, we will also provide alternative development scenarios. So. Uh, uh, looking at a number of different ways that we can look at the, the redevelopment of this uh, site based on what we're learning both uh, from the community, from the market, and about the environment uh, in, in this and the surrounding area. We will also get a full 
draft report uh, of the environmental assessment. As I said before, KCI uh, has really just started their study in the last few weeks and uh, they'll, they'll give uh, a full assessment and their recommendations uh, uh, as, as we ramp up for November 18th. So I wanna just thank everybody for hanging in there, asking great questions, uh, giving uh, uh, great comments. And I'm gonna turn it over to, um, uh, oh, so just very quickly, uh, the project team, I didn't get a chance to acknowledge everybody, uh, but you heard from Chidi, but Adele Gravitz from MNCPPC is also um, uh, uh, a key member of the team, as well as Fred Statura, who's the, our project facilitator. You can see the email addresses for Chidi and Adele here if you want to get in contact with them directly. If you want to find out uh, more about this uh, study, you can feel free to um, go to this uh, page on the MNCPPC website. Uh, that's www.pgplanning.org 334 slash community dash planning. And with that, um, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it back uh, to you, Councilwoman, and thank you for hosting this meeting tonight. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, Bingham, you have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for your assistance through this process over the last several months, um, starting um, a little bit over six months ago when we first connected. And uh, I appreciate you, uh, Chidi, Adele, Fred, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning. Thank you so much for the partnership because you know we recognize nothing can occur if we can't work together. So thank you so much for, uh, for initiating this with us. Um, I also wanna give a special thanks to HRNA advisors. You all are fantastic. Stan Wall and your team, Dan Reed, um, Alex Stokes, Solomon Abrams, and Jack Levitas. So thank you so much. Appreciate you. And KCI, thank you so much. Um, I learn so much every time I listen to you all. Um, this is not just a learning experience for, for those in the community, but truly for uh, me as a council person, for my staff, um, for all of us, and, and we're so appreciative. Uh, of, of how we're working together. Uh, I, Adam, um, thank you so much. Uh, I also wanna, wanna thank uh, Tim. Thank you so much, Tim, I appreciate you. Um, and I, I don't wanna forget anybody, but I feel like it's hard not to. I wanna take, thank my team, Gina Anderson Ford, Hugo Cantu, who's on the call, Carla Cash. I also have uh, Maurice Gibbs, who um, has been so helpful in, in getting research for us as well, this is you know, truly a, um, a team effort. Um, but just in closing, thank you, the community for, for participating. Um, I've asked my staff to put in my contact information, the office contact information in the, in the chat so that we can follow up with any questions, concerns, or pursuits you'd like our office to take uh, with regard to any challenges you might be having uh, or to uh, work with us to continue to develop ideas um, on how we can uh, make our community even stronger. Um, ultimately, you know, your health, um, your happiness, I, I always view health as wealth, is, is the dominant um, thought in my mind every day. How can we assure that our community is going to be healthy, um, healthy environmentally? We want to make sure that uh, none of these overflows that are occurring are, are going to negatively, negatively impact your health. Uh, we want to clear those up as much as we can. We want to have uh, a healthy economic uh, downtown or town center where um, you can enjoy a great quality of life and uh, be a part and within nature. One of the sites that I went to to kind of reflect on what we wanted to see was actually in Columbia, Maryland. And uh, they have very similar challenges that we have, but they've incorporated their challenge being water um, into beautiful amenities that uh, make for great focal points and relaxing uh, location sites. So we wanna, we wanna build that and bring that into our, into our community as much as we can. We wanna work, continue to work closely uh, with our agency partners, certainly DPI, DPW, and T. State Highway Administration is going to be a phenomenal partner here too. And uh, we'll have to look at our federal government as we look at the uh, waters of the US, specifically that uh, Henson Creek itself and seeing if there's a possibility of dredging that. And uh, once upon a time, that was a navigable waterway. Let's see if we can get back to that historic 
navigable waterway. I think we've got a good argument for, for getting it back to that. But again, thank you so much for your time. Do not forget, fill out your census. And if you've already done it, great, fill it out again. Just kidding. Um, but make sure your friends <laughs> get out there. Uh, your numbers matter. It is uh, your count that uh, allows us to, uh, to fund um, services. And so for you to be counted is, is tremendously important. Um, but I definitely want you to stay safe, stay healthy, uh, know that we're all in this together and uh, we're going we're gonna to do some wonderful things together. Just uh, stay with us, stay engaged, and thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next month. Or, um, thank you, next. Thank you right Councilwoman. Here. And I, I made a promise to your st uh, staff person, Gina Anderson Ford, yes. that I'd have everyone on screen so we can take a yes. screenshot of everyone who's involved in putting this together. Awesome. So if I can get Dan and Laura and Don, uh, with all your smiling faces, that would be great. And again, thank you to everybody. Uh, and thank you, Councilwoman, for hosting this meeting. And thank I you. Dan, I see Dan, I, Laura, Don, are you able to put on your cameras? Going once, going twice. Hey, Steve, this is Don. I think you have to disable me. All right, let me see if I can do that. I have not been... Uh, all right, I, that should do it. And then and I may need to do the same thing for you, Laura. So that should do it. All right, then I can't do the, I can't do Kim on the phone, but Laura, you should be able to put on your video now if you're able. I hope. Or maybe not, I, but I, I see that I've enabled you. So maybe uh, you're, not able to join on, on camera. Oh, there you are. I see you. All right. <laughs> Gina, you now have us. Let it, let us know when you, I can't, I can't hear you. So let us know when you want us. Are we good? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Take it right now. All right. Say District 8, everybody. District 8. <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Everybody Thanks, everybody. Ready? Have All a good right. night. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Stay healthy. Senses. And vote. Likewise. And vote. Right. Vote. And vote. <laughs> vote. 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 Yes. Vote. Have a good evening. Awesome job, Steve. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. You all are awesome. All right. I, I, uh, awesome. I'm going, I'm going to stop recording, Gina, and then okay. it should go to my desktop and I'll send it to you. <laughs> okay. Actually, okay. Funny, but I, get, I have it. I, it's all right. You do? Me. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad. We Don't just have control. to figure. Don't we control. just have to figure out how to answer some of these questions. Right, exactly. Aren't they incredible questions? <laughs> we're, still, uh, we're still recording you. We still have. To... <laughs>